unfortunately, I don't think in the near future we're, we're going to completely um, be a society without homelessness. But you can reach functional zero in the sense that you can make homelessness rare, brief, and temporary. That's Council Member Andrew J. Lewis expounding on that magic phrase, functional zero homelessness, in the Seattle downtown core. That's the goal of the King County Regional Homelessness Authority in 2023. But is that a reality? Also, what does the push to add more housing options in Seattle mean for your neighborhood as the city works to update its comprehensive plan? And when are you going to see a new permanent sidewalk cafe around the corner after a change this week to the city's permit system? So much to consider this week here on Seattle News, Views and Brews, your coffee break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel, and the views expressed here are mine all mine. My co-host is... Kevin Schofield, he is a weekly writer for the South Seattle Emerald. Danger is his middle name. And Kevin, I, I got to say, you had a recent tweet about the relationship between eating ultra processed foods and cognitive decline. Very interesting piece. But I just wanted to know, can I work out a deal where I can eat an average of one hot dog per week during the Mariner season next year? Because I feel like I need those nitrates, man. What do you think? For, for you, for you, anything. You know, and I'm going to have to cut back on my Twinkies, but yeah, <laughs> it might be worth it. All, all in moderation, all in moderation. Thank you, Kevin, as always, for joining me. Thanks to City Grind Espresso, our background noise sponsor for the audio podcast. Visit John on the first floor of City Hall and tell him Seattle News Views and Brews sent you. If you are listening, here's the deal. Please become a patron. We have a great holiday gift for you. Pledge at the $10 level and you get your very own special Seattle News Views and Brews mug sent to you. We'll feature you as our mug shot of the show. Only a few weeks left to order these before they go away, folks, at the end of the year. So. This week's mugshot, Kevin, thank you for drinking out of that one right there. But, but this week's mugshot is from our good friend, intern Rob, a classic here. He sent along a holiday greeting card to Kevin. Rob, I love this one. I had to run it again. You're the man. Thank you for your above and beyond support. And heads up, folks, here's a note from Converge Media. The Washington State Homeowner Assistance Fund, the HAF, is ready to help you out. Let's say you've fallen behind on your house payments because of something related to COVID. The half has you covered here. If you qualify, you get up to $60,000 with this deal. So reach out to their counselors. They're ready to help you get through the holidays. Give that hotline a call, 877-894-4663, or visit WashingtonHAF.org. Okay, then, it's time for Right Here, Right Now. We are going to start this week with something that looked like it was on the agenda, and then it was pulled, a report on the city's HOPE team, the acronym there, Homeless Outreach and Provider Ecosystem, in case you forgot. This is the city team that shows up during the cleanup or sweep of an unauthorized encampment. Why was this pulled from the Homelessness Committee agenda? Not entirely sure about that, but I pulled down this report, Kevin, and I wanted to talk about it because the data here paints a bit of a disjointed picture. What do you make of this report? Yeah, well, data is super interesting uh, on one hand. On the other hand, their data is still really bad. Yeah. Right. The King County. When you say bad, what does that what does that mean? Uh, there it's very uh, it's very incomplete. And it's very inaccurate. So, for yeah. example, you know they they list in this report a bunch of data about how the Hope Team and the King County Regional Homeless Authority are doing in terms of making referrals to shelter for people living unsheltered in our city and, and getting out into actually getting into the to those shelters. And they said yeah. that uh, the Hope Team in the third quarter of this year made 614 re referrals to shelter of which uh, 250 of them actually enrolled in the shelter within 48 hours. But yeah. they say, you know, we don't actually know if that, that number is, is, is real. It could be actually a bit higher than that because we don't have good data as far as tracking uh, and good systems in place for tracking who we give referrals to and whether they actually end up in those shelters. Right. So there could be right. more, but, you know, they didn't manage to track 250, which, you know, seems pretty low. And mm -hmm. you know the the both these teams toss around the number of the number of referrals they get yes. a lot. It's like here's you know the, the the best metric for the amount of work that we're doing, but, but a pretty low number are actually getting into those shelters. So what is right. what does that mean for you know shelter capacity? What does that mean for uh, how people who are living homeless right now are mm -hmm. viewing the shelters that we have? Right? Is this something yeah. that they're actually are we giving them something that's of value to them or yeah. not? Right. So that they're actually going to um, take. Yeah. 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 So, so the data they're getting the, the, you know, HMIS homeless management information system information they're getting mm -hmm. in general is just bad. 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, they've still, for privacy reasons, uh, they've made it optional for uh, people to actually provide information before they get into shelters. So mm -hmm. they don't really know like who is showing up in the shelters, who, uh, you know, who does that repeatedly, you know, um, and, and it, so it's just, it's very hard for them to track people. It's very, and, and part of that again is by design to, to yep. respect privacy for the people who want that sure, and not let that be a barrier to the people who, uh, okay. you know, they want to get into these kinds of shelters and get into yeah, yeah. Kinds of services, mm -hmm. but it just makes, you know, tracking how well these systems are doing very, very hard. Yeah, and I, I, in looking at this, Kevin, the, the other piece to it as well, I think about all these different service agencies that the KCRHA contracts with to do this work out on the streets there. They're going to be looking at those contracts next year and saying, okay, do we renew this one? Do we put this one on hold, et cetera? And I thought it was very interesting in this report on the HOPE team, this idea that entries in the HIMS reflect a very small portion of this overall work of homelessness. The KCRHA is planning to look at some different data reporting requirements when these outreach contracts are rebid. And that's a big, big piece of this, I think. Yeah. And, is, and you know, historically, those uh, outreach providers and, and other, you know, uh, nonprofits have resisted doing more reporting. Right. Again, they don't want to be collecting a ton of information. They also don't want to be having their own staff. And they are all struggling like every other organization around sure. here to hire people having their staff tied up, spending all the time doing paperwork as yeah. opposed to actually helping people. So right. there's been a lot of resistance to doing more reporting. So will yeah. the data get better? Will the, you know, will we have a better view as to how well the system is doing? It's really hard to say if that's going to get any better in the next year. Yeah, I know that was a big emphasis for Mark Dones, but just really quickly back on the HOPE team here, we had talked about this a little bit uh, last week and the week before when it comes to the Seattle City Council budget there. So the mayor initially was wanting this HOPE team to kind of get pushed over into this unified care team that he had talked about and wanted some more funding to go into that. That didn't really happen. Can we touch on that one last time, just looking at the HOPE team and, and the future of it and where it's going? Yeah, so another controversy around all this is uh, this question of who does outreach. And, yeah. you know, before there and was the HOPE team, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before there was a HOPE team, there was a navigation team. And mm -hmm. a bunch of the outreach providers in the city said, we don't want to be the outreach on the day that, you know, on site when a sweep is happening, when right. a, an encampment is being removed, because that will color the relationship that we have with people that we're trying to help and will make them trust us less. Mm -hmm. So the city actually basically created their own outreach positions, what they call system navigators in the yep. HOPE team to be able to do that day of outreach. Mm -hmm. um, now, what the city council just did in response to uh, Mayor Harrell saying, hey, uh, you know, I want to turn the, uh, the HOPE team into this unified care team. I mm -hmm. want it to have a regional approach so different areas of the city have their own mini team. Right, right, and right. And we're not playing off one, er one area of the city against each other. Everybody gets support for, for dealing with homeless encampments. Mm -hmm. He said, they said he, uh, the mayor said, I want to have some more outreach people so that we can have dedicated ones for, for yes. different areas of the city. City council said, no, nah, we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to be sort of scaling up our own outreach more. You know, this is why we have the King County Regional Homeless Authority. So they took that money out of the mayor's proposed unified care team budget and moved it over into the money that's going to fund the, uh, from the city going to fund the King County Regional Homeless Authority. But it's mm -hmm. not clear based upon what they said in the past that the Regional Homeless Authority is going to want to provide this day of outreach yep. mm -hmm. either, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, did did the city council just undermine this whole new unified care team by doing this? Boy. By yeah. making sure that like there's nobody there on site to actually provide outreach when when an encampment's being removed. That's a big, big question. And it brings us to the next topic that I wanted to cover with you, Kevin, which is this idea of zero functional homelessness in downtown Seattle by the year 2023. A lot of ink spilled on this topic as we get into December and closer to the new year. I also recently talked with Mark Dones about this. He is the CEO of the Regional Homelessness Authority. I talked to them on City Inside Out on Seattle Channel, as well as Councilmember Lewis on Council Edition. Functional zero, I know, is a little bit of a convoluted term, folks, but the basic idea is 
fewer people people are entering homelessness than exiting it and that enough resources are in place to get people off the streets. I'm just going to put that on the side for a while because there's a much bigger explanation for that. But Kevin, this overall goal of functional zero homelessness downtown, I know the RHA is working on this very hard. They have this partnership for zero where philanthropists are coming in too to try to work on this. Is this goal within reach in 2023? Is it within reach in 2023? No, absolutely it's not, right? Mm -hmm. We still have 787 people living on children in the city core. There is no plan in 2023 to bring on enough new permanent supportive housing and shelter capacity to get another 787 people off the street, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, and we're not moving people out of shelters and uh, and tiny home villages fast enough to create enough capacity to get off. So is that going to happen? No. But, uh, you know, I think the larger point of what this is leading to is saying you know that the king county regional homeless authority is trying to move and and city of seattle and king county's whole trying to move from a system that was largely measured by how much money was being spent Mm. on on various things to a system with an actual plan to reach a specific outcome right if we've got 787 people living on children city core what's it going to take to get them off the streets what are the resources that we need? Are we actually mm-hmm. taking the money yeah. that, that's being allocated towards homelessness and creating those resources that are needed to, to deliver on that part and then ring fencing them so that, that those resources can't be pulled off to other sources? We know, okay, right. we, this year we're going to get 787 people living you know, unsheltered in the city core, out of the city core. We've got the shelter mm-hmm. space. We've got the outreach workers. We've got uh, transportation for them. We've got storage for the blinds. Right. We've got everything right, all we that. need so we can go be successful and do that. There's never mm-hmm. been that kind of focused plan where they say, here are all the resources we need. We just every year mm-hmm. say, okay, well, we have this much of outreach. Let's up that a little bit more. We've got this much shelter. Let's up mm-hmm. that a little bit more, right? So again, right. it's been measured by how much money are we spending and not by what is the plan that we need to have and how do we just resource mm-hmm. everything that we need so we can be successful with that plan? So and in looking RHA, at that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say with the RHA, and I think this is the path you're about to go down, they have established or in the process of establishing this system, but I don't even know if that system can be fully fleshed out and established by, by the year 2023. Kind of what you're talking about where you put the system first and then you fund it rather than the funding and figure out the system. Yeah, and and... It's a bit of a vicious circle for them yeah. or, you know, hopefully a virtuous you know cycle for them. Right. So mm-hmm. and a lot of that is around credibility. Right. We, mm-hmm. you know, do we are we spending enough right now to solve homelessness? No, we're not. We have 13,000, yeah. almost 14,000, maybe more homeless people in King County. Do we have enough resources to get them all off the street and, and into, you know, into uh, shelter or, you know, into ho- housing? No, we, we actually don't. But they've been so ineffective with a lot of the resources and money they've been given so far that they've really hurt their own credibility. So how do they build back that credibility, right? If they go ask for more, you know, more money right now for all the resources they need to go be successful on getting 13,000 people off the street, they're not going to get it. Right. So do they start smaller? Do they say, okay, we're going to have a plan for the, the 787 in the city core and watch right. over the next mm-hmm. years as we're really successful on that part. And that will give us more credibility. And then mm-hmm. we can come back and say, okay, look, we've proven we can have a plan and go be successful at it. Now give us more money and we'll do that with more segments of the homeless population. We'll do that with the vets. We'll do that yep. with the Native Americans. We'll do that with mm-hmm. um, youth and young adults, right? Where we know yeah, right. that there are these specific segments with specific unique needs. We can build a plan for what they need and then go execute on that plan because we've plan. We just shown that we know how to build a plan and go execute on it. Yeah. And I will say Mark Jones told me in the interview that he did with me on City Inside Out, they're bullish on this idea of making this happen, at least downtown in 2023. We'll have to see how that plays out, of course, but this is a, it's a big conversation to have. Yeah. If if they could, it would be great, right? Again, it would give them more credibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is uh, by, by most measures, the most high profile area where homelessness has gotten out of control. Yeah. Right. And it's causing public safety issues and public health issues. And so if they, if they, you know, 
it's a two for if not a three for if they do that right they yeah. help a bunch of people who are living homeless they 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 um, improve a bunch of public safety issues they improve a bunch of public health issues in the city yeah. they make they make downtown uh, a place that people feel safer and want to mm -hmm. go back to mm -hmm. restaurants can open back up employees can right. go back and start working downtown again so you know it's a big win all around there's a, lots of good reason to choose that as the first one to do but again they need a plan you need to make sure yeah. they allocate and ring fence the resources to do it. And then they need to go yeah. execute well. Yeah. Yeah. So much going on with that. Thank you for that, Kevin. All right. Well, up next, a phrase that strikes terror in the hearts of some and may induce drowsiness in others. We're talking about the comprehensive plan, getting an update from the Seattle City Council. How's that going to affect your, your neighborhood? Stick around. We're talking about it on Now Hear This. Okay, do you like land use committee meetings? Of course you do. That's why you listen to this podcast. We love them too. So last week, the committee was hard at work talking about the 2024 update to the comprehensive plan. This is the plan that considers the density, the amount of homes Seattle can put in each neighborhood. It's important because we have a lack of affordable housing, as you know, and the city has grown twice as fast as anticipated in the prior comprehensive plan. Bottom line, there's a push to add more density here. Council member Teresa Mosqueda bristled at the idea that building heights would be limited in some residential areas to 30 feet to preserve the quote character of the neighborhood here's what she said about that and so i'm really concerned if what we're talking about is um limiting what could be considered um as a future design if we're looking at character within existing neighborhoods that were explicitly designed to exclude people from living in there and to exclude um, density and uh, diversity in terms of housing types and people. Kevin, we have talked about this plan before. How is this discussion shaping up? Where are we headed with the comprehensive plan? Right, so it's important to understand where we are and what stage we're, we're at in this process, right? Yes. This is a very long process. It It's going to end up with a, a, a major update to the comprehensive plan in 2024. Mm -hmm. which notably is after the next city council election. So, that, Correct. so the, yeah. <laughs> the, the people who are sitting on the city council right now are not necessarily the people who are going to be voting to up or down on this new comprehensive plan update. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. where they are right now is what's called the, the environmental impact statement. Any mm -hmm. changes, because this is expected to be major updates, any changes that are going to have an effect on livability in the city um, need to be studied first under state law. Right. So the environmental, so what the city is doing right now is the, um, the Office of Planning and Community Development is, it has written out a draft scoping document which says, these are the changes that we're going to look at. And for a lot right. of the sort of the zoning changes and where's housing going to go, they've got, uh, in the first draft they did right now, they've got five options. They've got one, which is no change, which is legally required. They have to, yes. uh, e even if nobody wants the no change option, legally they're required to go study what that would look like because there's still going to be, mm -hmm. you know, changes. People are still going to move here, you know, yep. buildings are going to fall down, you need to replace yeah. and, right. and you know, all that stuff. So, you know, like how many new housing units do we think are going to get built, even if we don't make any changes to zoning, right? This, mm -hmm. It's a good baseline. It's important to yeah. understand that. Then they got four other options for how aggressively to change zoning to allow, you know, control where new housing goes in the city, right? Should we make, you know, minor increases in our urban village areas? Should we, mm -hmm. up, you know, make larger increases there? Maybe some increases in what they call the, you know, the 15 minute transit corridor or 10 minute transit yeah. corridors, or, or do we more aggressively want to look at residential uh, zoning, what, what we classically call single family residential zoning across yeah. the city and say, Hey, let's up zone that to allow, allow uh, more housing there. The more, most aggressive option they have is actually sort of a combination of those. It says, let's right. you know, in increase density in urban villages, let's increase density in the 10 minute transit corridors and mm -hmm. in all residential neighborhoods in the city, let's allow for up to fourplexes. Right, and, and that's really what council member Mosqueda was pushing for these ideas of maybe a sixplex or something like that yeah. in different areas. And, and and I should point out the Seattle City Council last uh, over the past couple months here has eliminated this term single family zoning. You won't find it. Uh, it's not used anymore. But this, this is the next step here, basically trying to see what does that really yeah. mean when you eliminate a phrase like that? What does yeah. that mean when it comes to the comprehensive yeah, it, plan? It, 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 it's definitely marketing. It's definitely right. They didn't change mm -hmm. the zoning yeah. at all. They didn't change any rules about zoning. They just changed the name 
so that it's, you know, it doesn't say single, you know, it doesn't emphasize a single family anymore. And it was a setup to do exactly what they wanted. And I'm not saying that pejoratively. They were, it was a yeah. marketing effort to set up for the, exactly the conversation they're having right now. And so what the urbanists yeah. and other progressive organizations in the city are arguing for that Councilmember Mosquet has come out as a, the, the loudest champion for is to say, look, you know, apart mm -hmm. from these five alternatives that are already in this EIS scoping document, we want one more. We want an alternative six, which says let's allow for up to six plexes, uh, even you know, even more density in all residential zones. And as you go through that, raise the maximum building height from thirty to something uh, thirty feet to something higher, because that will also mm -hmm. that's you probably have to do that to allow for six plexes on on most residential right. zones in the city, right? To get six units in yeah. there. So they're arguing for going even more aggressively towards uh, this, and there's some good reasons to do that. Because, you know, a lot of the, the, the zoning, it, and it's not like there's never been, you know, a time where the zoning in the city allowed for, you know, more density. In fact, we see a lot of legacy mm -hmm. buildings in a lot of residential neighborhoods that have more housing, that, that, yep. you know, more uh, denser housing than that. And that was mm -hmm. pre kind of mid 20th century zoning changes that were made that were tied to redlining, that were tied yeah, to right. racist efforts to stop yep. people of color moving into mostly white neighborhoods right. uh, or entirely white neighborhoods in a lot of cases around the city, right? So there's a mm -hmm. racist history to a lot of the zoning and, and, uh, there are people today that are, you know, they're saying, well, we want to preserve the unique neighborhood character of some of these mm. single family yep. neighborhoods. And there are other folks who read that as, well, that's kind of a dog whistle for, you know, let's continue on and make sure that, you know, we don't change the ethnic makeup of these neighborhoods. Yeah. And I just wanted to jump in with one point here because Portland, our neighbor to the south there, has recently put some votes together. It was actually earlier this year to increase middle housing, as it's called, these fourplexes, duplexes, et cetera. But from a lot of the reports I've seen, there hasn't been a big explosion of these multiplexes there. I mean, I guess what I've seen is that these projects have to be practical. They have to be economical yeah. for builders. There's some other hurdles they have to go through. It's just not a simple equation here, I guess, if the council no. were able to pass something like this alternative six. They have to. They have to get funding. They have to get. Uh, they have to buy the land to go. You know. Uh, right. Uh, uh, um, you know, make these projects happen. They have to go through the whole design review process or administrative yep. review of the city. You know, there's just there's a lot that has to happen. So you know, none of these are like, okay. you, 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 when you pass a change like this, it doesn't mean like immediately all the projects are. <clears throat> there's, you're going to see overnight sort of all this yeah. denser housing. It's it is going to take probably generations, right? Because yeah. nobody is forced to sell their property to allow for that's these, right these, that's right right mm -hmm. so it, it takes a long time you know it's interesting that we're also seeing the state level you know this isn't just a local zone right, right? there mm -hmm. there are states now that are chain that are forcing changes in zoning across the entire state yep. to disallow you know single family zoning yeah right? oregon's one of them mm -hmm. oregon oregon is one of them right mm -hmm. so which is what one of the reasons portland you know who and portland was you know is, is the largest you know, uh, metropolitan center, you know, in, in population center in the state. And they were largely one of the ones who, who most strongly argued for this yeah. kind of zoning change mm -hmm. statewide yeah. um, to get them out of, you know, the advantage to them was get them out of a local battle, right? right. Trying to fight their own, you know, local voters on this, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, places mm -hmm. like Eugene, Oregon had the same sort of thing. Well, you know, we'll see what happens in Washington state, whether, whether yeah. this is a move they ever make here. Yeah, I know there's been talk about it at the state legislature level. So we'll we'll see what happens with that this year. I wanted to briefly touch on another neighborhood issue with you, Kevin. It looks like those street and sidewalk business permits the counter that council has wanted to make permanent. It's happening in the transportation committee this week. This was something where these permits were handed out for free to a lot of these businesses to help them through the pandemic. How's this gonna work making these things permanent, Kevin? What do you think? Well, it's not gonna be free. But it's going it's not to anymore, be right. really, yeah. really, it's going to be really cheap. Like yeah, none okay. of these permits, okay. getting one of these permits isn't going to break the bank. And and you know that might end up being controversial in its own because you know they're they're essentially you know the, the, that sidewalk space you know mm -hmm. is 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 in a lot of cases is really great space. And, yeah, it's valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's value. It's valuable real estate. They're basically giving permits to it for very low prices. You know, like five hundred dollars a year or less to right. um to businesses to you know to use um 
and but but you know it's great for businesses and certainly we're at the point in the city of, of the economic recovery where that's still going to be important for businesses particularly we want you know restaurants and there's a lot of places in the city where restaurants are still struggling to come back from right. the pandemic where you know it's not time to start pulling back on ah you know restaurants don't need and retail you know businesses right. don't, they don't need, need help any baloney yeah. they they, mm -hmm. they sure do so the fees are pretty modest um the way that this seems to be structured by the council is that rather than have the city council legislate, here is exactly how the permit program is going to work. They're giving an yep. enormous amount of, um, of of flexibility to SDOT, to the Seattle mm -hmm. Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. to issue the permits, to set their own what they call director's rule for how to yep. you know man, you know manage these permits, how many the you know what the rules are for the permits. Yep. So. This is a case where the city council is not taking a heavy hand on it, saying, here is exactly how this program is going to work. It's like, we want this program. We're going to legislate this program is okay. And we're going to let SDOT write all the rules for it. Yeah. And their new director there and Greg Spots taking this over. Yep. Thank yep. you for breaking that piece down with me, Kevin. All right. Coming up. How do you prosecute a former president? You never really think you're going to have to ask that question, but we live in strange <laughs> times here. And Kevin has looked into this topic. He wrote about it in the South Seattle Emerald. It's our podcast gem of the week. Kevin, you wrote recently in the South Seattle Emerald the possibility of prosecuting former President Trump, who's also running for office again. Some attorneys have already put out a memo on this. So I thought this was very interesting. As the Department of Justice is considering its options here, what was this memo all about? Yeah, so a bunch of uh, high-powered attorneys who, uh, a couple of them formerly worked for the DOJ or, you know, as, as defense attorneys, uh, but uh, they're all in private practice right now or retired, uh, wrote basically a draft of what they know the Department of Justice is is almost certainly writing internally right now, which is what they call a prosecution memo or a pros memo, which says when the DOJ is getting ready to file charges, they write this memo that lays out this whole, uh, you know, here are the facts that we have, here's the law related to this, here's how we would apply the, mm -hmm. you know, the facts we see to the law, here's, you know, uh, possible defenses uh, that there might be, and then kind of, you know, so what's our recommendation about the, the charges should be that should be followed? So based upon yep. all the public information that's come out around these various Some things that, related yeah. to January 6th and related to, mm -hmm. you know, keeping documents at Mar-a-Lago, you know, laying out, okay, publicly here are the facts that we know, here are the laws, here's how it applies. And, you know, in the end, they, they concluded, we think that there's a, a strong case for uh, filing charges against you know, former President Trump uh, related mm -hmm. to both January 6th and the Mar-a-Lago incident and, yeah. or, you know, number of incidents there. Yeah. Now, you know, it's interesting to say, you know, the, these attorneys don't have the full set of information that the DOJ right. has and the mm -hmm. FBI has, right? Which, you know, can cut a couple different ways here, right? Mm -hmm. The DOJ probably has even stronger evidence and testimony that Trump committed crimes. Yeah. But they may also have evidence, what they call ex exculpatory evidence, that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, shows that uh, maybe, at least in the way the laws are written, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you'd have a strong defense against some of these, right? Okay. Or, okay. you know, some of, you know, evidence showing that some of the folks who've testified aren't credible and they wouldn't right. stand up in court, right? So mm -hmm. there may be some evidence that they have that makes a stronger case. It may be evidence that says, yeah, we would never be able to actually prove that particular charge in, in, in court. But the, at the end of the day, they looked at like six different laws and said, yeah, you know, there's some strong cases to, to be made here that, uh, that, that, that Trump has committed multiple felonies. Wow. This is, it's, it's fascinating. And it's one of those headlines that isn't going to go away, but I, we need to get rolling here, Kevin. I got to get, get out of here, but I, I needed to make sure I checked in with you about Mariners free agents. So much happening right now with the, oh, M's, yeah, 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 we're yeah, in the middle yeah. of wintertime. So the M's just landed this uh, former all-star second baseman, Colton Wong from the Brewers. Yep. So does that yep. mean bye-bye to Adam Frazier? He is a free agent this year. He was their second baseman last year. Does he play outfield? Do they want him back? Some quick thoughts on this one in the in the hot stove version of SNV in VB here. Yeah, Colton Wong uh, was a good pickup. He's yeah. a, he definitely you know is uh, an improvement. Uh, he's a he's a strong hitter. He's a uh, you know he hits for power right, so he's going to hit some home runs. I like that. Uh, he had he had a bit he had a bit of an off year on the defensive side mm -hmm. this past year. Yep. But nothing that he can't, you know, rebound from, and and be playing yep. with, you know, a strong, a very strong, you know, defensive team, 
in mm -hmm. Seattle Mariner. So, so that would be a really good thing. Frazier, Frazier can play a couple different positions. So, yeah. you know, he may, he may decide to stick around. He, he may not, uh, yeah. you know, we'll see what happens. You know, there's, there's a couple of positions that, uh, the Mariners need to fill. They could use another really strong corner outfielder. Yeah. They could reuse another really strong starting pitcher. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If they, if they fill those two, they're looking great. Yeah, but you can see a lot of the like Colton Wong is going to be a free agent a year from now. You right, can see right. the moves that the Mariners are making right now. Are they are now. they're mm -hmm. they're gunning mm -hmm. to to win in twenty twenty three. That's right? right. Yeah, they're trading off. So, you know the the they're now once again in a position where like at AAA they're pretty thin. Yeah, not a lot of talent left at AAA. There's some more lower down the organization. Yeah. But you know they're not a lot they can draw on because you know Julio's come up in this right. past year. A whole bunch of other folks, mm -hmm. really star guys, they had Triple A. They pulled up to the majors, mm -hmm. and you know some of them doing pretty well. But yeah. uh, they're you know to finish off these holes, they're going to have to go outside because they just don't have the talent ready to go at Triple A right now. Ah, this is great stuff, Kevin. Thank you as always for joining me here. Thanks to everybody listening to Seattle News Views and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics and sometimes baseball too. The podcast is on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. Please find Seattle News Views and Brews on Patreon. Need your support here. Show your support if you could. Thanks also for watching on Converge Media too. See you next time. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2022.